There are many ways to construct the individual elements of a factory, and yet what I see when I watch YouTube videos of other Factorio players is a large proportion seem overly committed to just one of these variants. This isn't a criticism. As I said, there are many ways to build in this game, and how you choose to do so is completely up to you. It also isn't a problem from a factory perspective. As long as you have enough assembly machines to do the job, with the correct levels of ingredients, and you are using the right inserters and conveyor belts, then the factory will get the job done, regardless of how it is laid out. This tutorial is about just one thing, making it look sexy. Hello, I am Bigfoot, and today I'm going to try and show you how to build sexy blocks in Factorio. Okay, so to start with, I'm going to go right back to first principles and start with the basics. To some of you, hey, maybe all of you, this first part might seem completely obvious, like I'm describing the very fundamentals of the game, but I find it important to start with the simple stuff and build up from there. If I'm going to try and teach a topic so that I think I'm achieving a complete understanding with you, my viewer, then the obvious stuff comes first. So here we go, gears. Gears are just one example of the most simple of Factorio processes in that there is only one input ingredient and one output ingredient. Each assembly machine needs to be fed with two conveyor belts, one to bring in the iron plate and one to remove the gear. The common way to arrange this is with a conveyor belt down the middle, assembly machines either side and then output outside of that. And this is fine until you need a lot of them and then it becomes an unwieldy, long, thin rectangle. This is the kind of block layout I see so often in Factorio videos. Another way we can arrange this is with both conveyor belts running down the middle, but this requires the use of long inserters, and sometimes when you start pushing a factory to its limits, the long inserters can become the bottleneck. Since they can't be upgraded, this puts the production rate of the factory at a permanent disadvantage and it cannot be rectified. So this is a bit of a risky setup and its use needs to be carefully considered, but ultimately it is a valid way of arranging a one input, one output block. We can also arrange the conveyor belts to be at right angles to each other, with assembly machines tied to the next one, but since these inputs need to be tied together for longer blocks, we still end up with the same two conveyor belts running sideways, so no space is gained. This setup ends up being less space efficient than the other variants, but it is useful to keep in mind for later. So that is gears and all other one input and one output systems like copper wires and pipes and such. Then we have two input, one output systems. Again, we can arrange this as before with two conveyor belts running down the middle and one output belt outside of that. And again, this is the common variant that I see on YouTube, but it ultimately suffers from the same long inserted problem as before, in that if a lot of ingredients need to be input in a short time, then in some situations the long inserter won't be fast enough. If this is the situation you find yourself in, then there are options. The first of which is to mix the two ingredients on a single conveyor belt down the middle between the assembly machines, and this allows us to use fast inserters. We need to be mindful that we are now doubling the amount of material on that conveyor belt, but if inserters are the critical element, then this will fix that. If the issue is both, i.e. the inserters and the conveyor belts are both critical, then we need to arrange the belts in such a way that all three belts, the two inputs and the one output, are all accessible from the assembly machine with a fast inserter, and this is the setup we end up with. This is the block layout I use for green chips. Carrying on the theme, Next is three input, one output systems. And as before, we can arrange this in a number of ways. As the inputs and outputs increase, so do the number of variants. So there are a lot of options for these recipes. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail because I'd be here all day. I'm going to assume that you aren't shy with the pause button and can pause it and look at it in depth that way. But briefly, top left, we have the standard configuration with long inserters. Below that, we have the same, but with the main two inputs mixed down the middle and then the other two options are similar, just with the conveyor belts turned at right angles. In general terms, the recipes for three input, one output systems are not time or ingredient critical, i.e. long inserters can generally be used without penalizing the factory because production rates are lower, but not always. If you are looking to push the yellow inserters and railways to their limit to get the maximum SPM, then you will need to use this last block setup, which again, only uses fast inserters. Long inserters will not work for these recipes. There might be other recipes this applies to, but none that immediately spring to mind. The long inserters are just too slow and they won't keep up with the production process. And believe me, I've tried. This last let up is the only one I've gotten to work 100% of the time. Anything more than three input, one output, and the block will either be a semi-machine critical, i.e. no matter how many ingredients you feed it or inserters you place next to, 
the assembly machine will determine how quickly the block performs and so how you lay it out will not make any difference or it will need so much material I'm looking at you rocket silo the production rates of the final product won't matter this is dictated by the recipes in vanilla if you are playing with a set of mods then the recipes might be different and this might be a situation you do need to overcome but also from my experience in these situations you will have access to faster conveyor belts and inserters and assembly machines so less of this applies overall the thought process of this tutorial is absolutely applicable to all of factorio but the specifics of what i talk about here are ultimately only for factories in vanilla so these are the basic ways we can arrange the inputs and outputs around the assembly machines with conveyor belts but we also have pipes and chemical plants and the same basic lessons we went through with the assembly machines apply here one input one output systems we can arrange in series like so this is only really applicable to lube if we need to add conveyor belts then we are fine and dandy so long as we only have one row but with multiple rows next to each other i tend to find that repeating it looks ugly so this is the alternative setup I tend to use, which I think looks better. But again, it relies on long inserters, so its use needs to be carefully considered. The only real exception to this kind of setup for me is sulfuric acid, which I tend to organise like so, with the chemical plants laid out nose to nose and tail to tail. Because we have two liquids to deal with and two input conveyor belts, one of which is sulphur and needs to be input with a fast inserter, we can't use long inserters because the quantity of sulphur required is so high. I have tried a few different ways and this is now my standard way for sulfuric acid. If we have multiple input liquids and multiple rows of chemical plants lined up next to each other, then we will need three pipes between the chemical plants, two of which are duplicate. This is because underground pipes can't intertwine and without this third pipe the inputs would cross each other and ruin the flow. Okay, so those are the basic principles and they are pretty universal to all of us. From here I want to go through what I like to call the centerline geometry. I briefly went through this in my evolution of design video, but there are two basic choices for laying out blocks in Factorio, the edge geometry and the centerline geometry. On the screen, you can see the two most basic options for these setups. If they are laid out correctly with all the correct infrastructure, then both of these setups will have the exact same production. There is no difference between the output of either block. The only difference is that I think the one on the left is sexier. If we start laying down multiple blocks in series with the centerline geometry, then the inputs and outputs need to split and join down the middle. To do this, we will need another widget. In that evolution of the design video, I went through the design of a widget that perfectly mixed its ingredients so that there was no bottleneck in the mixing mechanism. And that is most definitely my most favorite widget. And we will be using it later, but it isn't the only widget I use. In order to run a conveyor belt down the centerline, we need not only to split it left and right, but we need also need to split it down the center line so that it carries on and feeds the following rows. To do this, we place two splitters on that conveyor belt with a tile between them. We then remove the conveyor that links the two splitters and link them using the other side. We can then run an underground belt from that free end and carry on the conveyor belt down its original path. The second splitter will feed left and right. This is my second favorite widget, the center line widget. We can also fulfill the same job with a pair of splitters set up like so but I prefer the first method for reasons. I don't know. I think I just prefer the narrower setup. Both methods work fine though, so the choice is up to you. And we can also use both setups to join the outputs of the block along the center line. It can do that job also. While we're on the subject of joint outputs, we can also do something like this if we wish. Assuming the production is identical on both sides, which it should be, there is no reason why we need to use a centerline widget to join the outputs because we can simply butt the conveyor belts against each other with the main centerline belt in the middle. Which one of these I use for the outputs tends to come down to how I feel at the moment I'm constructing it. Sometimes I'm focused and use the widget. Sometimes I'm lazy and don't. It's 50-50. But if you do decide to butt the belts against each other and the block happens to have an even number of rows, then you can do a pretty cool thing. The output belt is able to output in any of the four directions and still keep a perfect flow. Whichever orientation you prefer, it can do, and if you happen to change your mind and want something else, it is really easy to change. I use this kind of setup for my research all the time because I don't have to worry about output flow direction, and if I get crowded in, I can quickly change things without demolishing much, if anything at all. It's just a cool thing. Okay, so how do we actually use any of this? There are some processes in Factorio that are heavily time dependent and so a lot of assembly machines are required. 
This is probably something that most people use modules and beacons to fix, and that is fair enough. It isn't something I do, I like big sexy blocks. But the approaches I'm going to go through will be equally applicable. Large blocks are generally required for low density structure, engine, rocket control unit, and speed module. For these four processes, a block can be constructed with two input belts and one output belt. For low density structure and engines, we need three inputs, but none of them are really time dependent, maybe copper for low density structure, so we can mix two of the other ingredients on one of the belts and use long inserters. Essentially, we can use the same block size for all four of these processes, but simply adjust the width of the block to increase the number of assembly machines and match it to the factory production of what we require. What this means is that for each of these four processes, which are the most greedy in terms of real estate, a block can be constructed that is the exact same length as all the others, and so by adjusting the width of the block, these processes can be easily stacked next to or on top of each other. This is something I do a lot, probably in every vanilla factory I do, but it is most notable in my 2000 SPM time lapse. Mmm, look at all that sexy geometry. Anyway, moving on. Let's say we've done our calculations and we have concluded that we need 100 assembly machines to carry out one of these four processes. Well, firstly, 100 is a really awkward number, and yes, I know I chose it, but I wanted to start with something awkward because very rarely do the numbers work out absolutely perfectly. So why is 100 awkward? Well, assembly machines line up in pairs, both feeding from the same input belts, so straight away we need to divide it by two. Then, because we are using a centerline geometry, we need everything to be symmetrical, so those two need to be reflected by another two on the other side of the centerline. And 100 divided by 2 times 2 is 25, and 25 is odd, i.e. it's not easily divisible. It isn't possible to arrange 100 assembly machines in a block other than either 2 by 50, with the centerline splitting 25 on either side, or 10 by 10, with 5 on either side. Those are the only two options, a big square or a long thin rectangle. I find that incredibly limiting. So what to do if this is where you find yourself? Well, you can either try and make 96 work, which would be a grid of 12 by 8, or 8 by 12, or 4 by 24, or you can move up to 120, which would be a grid of 12 by 10, or even 128, so 16 by 8, 8 by 16, 4 by 32. This is the kind of logic you will need to apply to the grid layout. If you are building a big block, then there are just certain numbers that work out best, and in a lot of situations you will find yourself rounding up to one of these numbers, which are easily divisible by 4, 8, 12 and or 16. Unusual grid layouts do occasionally work, 108 could also work for 100 assembly machines with an 18 by 6 layout for example, and I do occasionally use them, but the easiest starting point is a number that isn't. In my first 2000 SPM base, at the time of the release of this video, my second one is still under construction, what I calculated I needed was 70.2 low density structure per second, which without modules requires 1,123 assembly machines, a number way too high to think about being in a single block. After playing around with it in my preferred mod, which is Hell Mod, what I found was that if I split this into eight identical blocks, then the numbers worked out almost perfectly. So 70.2 divided by eight is 8.78 LDS per second per block. Round it up to 9 and we need 144 assembly machines, which I chose to be a grid of 24 by 6. If we take a look in Hell Mod, then 9 LDS per second requires 180 copper, which is 4 full belts of copper, 45 plastic, which is 1 full blue belt of plastic, and 18 steel, which is 40% of a blue belt of steel and is a little awkward, but as I said earlier, the numbers don't always work out absolutely perfectly. When you are building these blocks for yourself, the most important input to consider is the largest one. For LDS, this is copper, and for this layout I need four belts of copper, which is simply a perfect number for a centerline geometry, to either side. I've been building this block in the background, and what you can see is the mixing widget right in the middle, two blue input belts of copper either side, with a single gap either side for the output. Each belt of copper is going to feed 12 rows of assembly machines, and the mixing widget is going to feed the other input belt for the whole block. This way the distribution of all inputs is as perfectly balanced as possible without going completely overboard. Because we are relying on splitters which will always split 50-50, the processes earlier in the block will always get fed first, but ultimately over a long stretch of time the whole block will fill and the production rate of the block will rise. If we want a completely perfect distribution of material then we will need a much more complicated belt setup but this is cumbersome and unnecessary in my opinion.
This is the basic process I go through whenever I'm building these big blocks in Factorio. How many inputs outputs are there? Which ingredients are critical and which are not? Which block configuration am I going to use? How many assembly machines do I need? Is there a way I can divide that total into a few standard blocks that I can blueprint and copy? How many input output belts does that block need? Does the block need a mixing widget? Do I need to allow extra space in the sense line belt area just to make things neat, symmetrical or easy to construct? Some of these questions I will need to answer outside of the game with a calculator or mod or spreadsheet. Some of these questions I will need to answer by building the thing and finding out for sure. And eventually, by fiddling and messing around and moving things about, I will get to a point where I'm happy with it. This is the process. Now there are other big blocks in the game that I haven't covered. Things like plastic and rocket fuel. On the screen is a centerline setup I built for the first 2000 SPM factory for plastic but I couldn't find a way to make it work elegantly, so I ended up with a standard one belt in, one belt out setup. Part of the fun of the game for me is in discovering new ways and new geometries for how to build this stuff and make it look elegant. I'm showing you this to give you some idea of what is possible when you start throwing liquids into the mix, but I'm not going to go through the design because I want you to go out there and discover these things for yourself. Purple science with railways is always interesting if you start to approach it with this kind of method. You will need multiple belts for the railways into purple science, so many of my earlier factories have bottlenecked with this one particular ingredient. Yellow inserters are tricky, I've, I've already covered it, with three inputs and one output and a very short construction time. I want you to discover these things for yourself, because I want to see other setups out there in the factorial universe, other kinds of factory design in videos on YouTube. I want you to come up with something sexy. As always, any questions, pop them in the comments, and I will do my best to answer them. Till next time.